Okay, so, so let's make a start. So, what I'd like to do today and for the next few sessions is to talk about some things to do with graphical user interfaces. And I'd also, if there's time at the end of one or two lectures, I've got some of these um, these multiple choice quizzes. And this, this I've found is quite a good consolidation exercise for some of the stuff that we've done in the past to sort of go through this and then yeah, give you a few minutes to, to, to look at these and then discuss those. So if there's time at the end, we'll have a look at one of those. But the main focus I want to draw you to first is this material about graphical user interfaces. So uh, generally this material sort of follows on from some of the stuff in the in the book, chapter 10 of the book, and there's a nice uh, tutorial part of the standard Java tutorial material. So, the main system for doing graphical user interfaces in, in Java is, 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 uh, is, called the, is called Java Swing, and it's, there's a sort of slightly strange history to this in that there's something that, the, the, in the early versions of Java, and still in there, there was something called the Abstract Window Toolkit, which was a way of realizing graphical user interfaces, bringing up windows, <coughs> having various forms of interaction, like buttons and sliders and all that. And the original version was uh, the AWT, the original uh, graphical user interface system for Java, was built very much system specifically. So each operating system had its own implementation of that. Whereas Swing, which was introduced a few years after the original Java system was created, was designed to build a lot of this infrastructure in Java itself and only draw on a few very primitive uh, things in terms of things that, was, that were specific to the operating system. So basically, it builds on a small number of simple drawing primitives, which we'll talk about in a future lecture. But for the purpose of using this, you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, care about that very much. I mean, basically, what you need to do is to understand this system of components, these things about how buttons and menus and lists and text boxes work, and then how they're all fitted together, how they're laid out together. There's a number of systems for doing this. There's a number of um, ways of specifying how these components are laid out. And this is part of something called JFC, which isn't a <coughs> place that sells fried chicken, but it's uh, called the Java Foundation classes. And it's, uh, that, that includes these, these things and also a, a 2D drawing system called Java 2D that we'll talk about. So that gives us a general background to that. And so what we'll do here is we'll talk about some general ideas today. And then there's an exercise, I don't think it's today's class, I think it's first couple of classes for next week, there are some exercises about constructing some of these. And we'll do some stuff with constructing them directly from code, but there are also, in things like NetBeans and Eclipse, there are systems for creating these graphical user interfaces that are much more drag and drop and so on. And so we might have a look at those and compare the different ways of doing it. So let's have a think about different kinds of programs. So we can distinguish between two kinds of programs. So there's the sort of programs we've looked at so far, which essentially carry out a sequence of operations. Yeah, so you have a program, you create an object, you know, when you think about BlueJ, you click on some object and then run some methods in it. That creates other objects which then have certain methods called on them. 
and then, <coughs> you know, as you get on to thinking about how you might have a, a program that stands alone from something like BlueJ, you've got the notion of a, a main method, a main class with a main method in it, so there's a starting point for, for that program. And essentially this just uh, plows on systematically. There are, you know, there are choice points, there are conditionals, there are loops and things. But essentially it moves on in a linear way through the code. So you might read data in from files or from the user. You do some kind of computation. You generate output. And you do this in some order and then eventually come to an end. And this is a kind of sequential kind of way of programming. But graphical user interfaces don't work like this. They're very different to that. And, and, and what the main difference is, is that they are driven by events. They're driven by actions that the user takes. And so we can see this as being, having this sort of structure rather than it being a flow of control with various loops and options. You've got this kind of structure, <coughs> which is you start the program, that puts controls like buttons or text boxes and so on into the window. And then, essentially, the program sits in this state here for very long, you know, for the rest of the time it runs. So essentially it's sitting there being reactive to events that the user creates. So you know, you'll take an action, you'll click a button, type in some text, um, you know, draw something with the mouse or whatever, and there'll be some action, some event that happens as part of, as a follow-on to that. And then, typically at the end of that, you'll then return to this waiting state. So you'll be there waiting for the next user interaction. And sometimes, you know, this will, the results of one of these actions will be to transform what's available. So you might have the code here, and it displays a main window, and then you take an action and what that does within this event, handling code, is it brings up another window with some different controls in. And at that point, you know, the actions you can take are different. But on the whole, at any one point, you've got this code running in a number of actions, which may or may not be available at any point. And of course, one thing you can do is to close down the program. You select quit from a menu, or you click on the a corner of a, of a um, window, and that final action is how the program ends. So that's, that's the sort of idea of how these programs work. So you need to sort of think a bit differently about how these, these work compared to the kinds of programs we've seen so far. So I think this is just summarizing what I've said. So a program using this Java Swing GUI stuff will have a certain amount of code to initialize it to start things off. So you start your main method and that will create one or more windows which have got these, these components and subcomponents or, or, or containers, things that contain other things that, uh, that are part of the interface and brings them together and puts them, lays them out in some way. And then by this stage you've got, you've got the visual part of it, you've got the thing that you can click on and add things, you know, add text or, or images into or whatever you're, you're doing, but it doesn't actually do anything. So you need some methods that tell you how, how actions in the program connect with those components. And so today and uh, tomorrow we'll focus on, on these, these bits and then next week we'll have a look at the 
you can have a look at this, or perhaps we can have a look at this in passing today, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll mostly talk about that in a future session. And so basically, what does the work in the program is this, this code that responds to these actions. So we have a couple of listeners that wait, <coughs> just wait for an action, and then when it finds that an action has happened, reacts to it and changes the state of the program in some way, perhaps throws up other components in the user interface. So, <coughs> the way to think about this is that there's a lot of different components drawn from a large set of possible components, and we'll, we'll list these in a few slides' time. And rather than these components just being thrown randomly at the interface, they're grouped together in some way using uh, something called containers. So, kinds of things that are components in a graphical user interface are things like buttons you can click, menus that you can select from, text labels, image labels, all that sort of stuff that you see every day within a a computer you know, using a computer, and then the way that this is structured is that they are how the computer knows how to lay them out is because of the use of containers. Now, in this system, these are all rectangular regions. That's that's not surprising if you think about what a uh, computer interface looks like. It has a lot, you know, you have a window, and then there'll be perhaps a one or two rectangles full of um, options at the top, and if you bring down a menu, you know, there'll be little rectangles containing the menus, and then that will bring up a rectangle of, of options. And <coughs> so, <coughs> so this kind of thing about rectangular regions is, is no big constraint for most most issues, most um, systems, and. Importantly, these components can either contain these, these containers can contain these components directly, or they can contain um, <coughs> other containers in their own right. So you might have a window that's split down into a number of regions, and each of those regions is then, is then further split down into in, in, into other regions, so you might have the idea of something, you know, I split your window into a main area and something on the left and something at the top, and then the area at the top might be split into a number of different functional uh, regions depending on the kinds of actions you're, you're, you're using. So if you think about Microsoft Word, where the, it seems the amount of space dedicated to typing text gets smaller and smaller, um, you have more and more of these regions containing little buttons that you can press to do various things. And so you end up with this kind of hierarchical structure, uh, you know, a big container, the whole window itself, and then <coughs> in its own, its own way it contains other things which contain other things until you eventually get down to things that actually do something. And then, you know, there's technical details really, you know, these uh, draw from a, a superclass called J component. So these things in the swing library are uh, 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 largely um, subclasses of this, and they also link with this windowing toolkit in small number of places using things like container. But that's probably a, a sort of technical detail unless you're really trying to develop new components for the system. So <coughs> let's have a look at a very simple example. So <coughs> here's a, a simple example. Let's just show this, this running. So what this does is it just brings up a window and puts some text on it. So if we um, if we have a look at this, if we just run this from the command line, so do that, and it just brings up a little box up there, yeah. 
So there's some text inside a box, uh, inside a window, and we can do the usual things, things that are so elementary that we don't really think you have to bother about these. But of course, you do have to think about them, like being able to close that when you do that. So what's happening there? Well, this is fairly straightforward. If it's got one window, and then we're adding this label directly to that window. So, we've got a main method, nothing else. And then the thing that's, that's, that's uh, corresponding most directly to a window on the screen is this thing called a, a J-frame. So a J-frame is basically a window, is, is the best way of thinking about it. I don't know why it's, why it's got that slightly obscure name. I certainly know that these, the, the, all these things beginning with J are the, the names given to these swing components. And that's because the basic words like frame and label were already being used by this earlier thing, this AWT toolkit. So to distinguish them, they added the, the letter J for Java, presumably, to the, the beginning of all these to, to create a new set of uh, unambiguous names. So what happens? Well, a frame can have a, a you know, a frame is just a, it's just a certain kind of uh, object, and so it's got a constructor, and the constructor takes a title, so that puts the title at the top of the window, and then you can start adding things to it. So I said, you know, we, don't, we normally think about this, this idea that when you click that uh, exit button, the red button in the Mac, and the button with the cross on in one or two of that, operating systems, but that closes the window. And usually you want to allow that to happen, so you would add a little line like this. So this is <coughs> the very beginnings of these actions, but this is a very simple one. This is, you know, most of the time it will be more complex than that. So basically that sets some kind of thing, and then whenever that happens, during the, the running of the program, that's going to uh, exit. That's going to um, that's going to that's going to when you when you click on that 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 thing that closes the window, that's going to tell you that you should actually do that. So that's just setting up some behaviour that we would normally expect. Now, one thing we can do. I talked about containers, but the simplest thing to do is not to use that at all. You can just add these components directly to the frame. This is probably not something you would normally do. This is just a very simple example. But we've tried to pare this down to the simplest. So again, we've got another class called JLabel. So JLabels are typically pieces of text. So that's a piece of text that displays in the window that you can't interact with. So what's going on here? Well, we've got a new J label called Hello World. So that creates it. So now we've got this label, we've got this object that represents the notion of writing Hello World into a window or into a, a container or a window. But there's, an, there's complexity here. Be a major complexity. We've created it, but we haven't said where it's where it's going. So we need a second. We need a second line to put that into the frame. Put that on the window. So this will be very typical for how this little pattern will be very typical for how we create these user interfaces. We'll create components and containers and then we'll add them, we'll add the components either directly to the window or more typically into containers which will then be added to the window. So that's how that happens, so that's how the text appears on the, on the window. And then there's finally a couple of things which are very boilerplate. There's a method called pack, 
slightly obscure term, but basically that's to do with setting the size of the window. So that creates the window so that it's of the size to contain all of the things that are uh, placed on it. And then when you create one of these frames, um, initially it's set to be what's called invisible. So it's there, but it's not, it's not actually displayed as a window. And the reason for that, presumably, is that you don't want to open up a program, and if it takes a bit of time to create all these things, you don't want to watch it or building it all up and all these things shuffling into place. So you typically create that first, and then when it's, when it's been created, you set it visible so it appears on the screen as a whole, a whole thing. So that's a simple example. So I think the slide just says what I've said basically. You start with this, the thing I probably didn't mention, which is obvious really, is that you need to do this import. We've seen these import things before, yeah? So if you're, if you're doing something in, in Java and you want to do something other than use the basic core language, you start with an import statement and then say what you want to import. So this one's called Java X, Java extensions of some kind, dot swing, dot star, and that brings all the things to do with the swing, the swing uh, system into the program. And then, you know, we've got some notes about the, uh, the, the different components there. So the J frame is the basically the window, so that's kind of container, special kind of container. So typically you'd have one of these, which is the window, this is the, the program, and you may create others, um, and then you know you put a string in it, I've said this as we go along, um, yeah, I've said all that. So let's get on the next one as well. So this might be, 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 be worth thinking about a bit more. So basically how you add this is add, how you add the content to a window or to a subcontainer is by using this add method. And that's typical, but frames are a bit more complicated for some technical reason. You have to get something called a content <coughs> pane. Um, that's because frames contain some code for specifically for displaying it as a window and then it contains this this thing called a, a content pane which is which is the, the thing that actually receives the components and containers that are going to be displayed in that window. And I've already talked about path and set visible. So that's a fairly straightforward example. Now there's there's a, there's an added complexity here which I'll talk about in passing a little bit now, and then we'll talk about in more detail another time. Talk about this idea more generally another time, which is the notion of threads. So threads are a kind of concurrency in Java. So concurrency means doing more than one thing at a time. So there's a little quote from the Java tutorial here. That we take it for granted that systems can do more than one thing at a time continue to work in a word processor whilst other applications download files, manage the print code, queue, and stream audio. And importantly for what we're talking about here, even a single application is expected to do the more, more than one thing at a time. So a digital audio application has to read the audio, decompress it, manage the playback, update the display. A word processor has to respond to keyboard and mouse events even if in the background it's formatting text or updating the display. So you need some kind of notion of concurrency. You need some notion that you can set the computer to do things in the background whilst also processing user interactions and so on. And so you've got a notion of threads. So when you create a program in Java that main flow of control can be seen as a, a thread of activity. It's something that does a sequence of actions in the program. 
And then <coughs> what you can do is create other threads. So in a single threaded program, if you reach a point where you're waiting for something, it stops and doesn't carry on, yeah? So if you reach a point in a program that asks the user for a file name or asks the user to input their name and address, say, then typically the program would work through the code until it reached that point, and then it would stop. It would stop, and all the rest of the code wouldn't be executed until you'd done that interaction. So you would just you would just stop at that point. So what you can do with threads is you can say, here's the main program, and then I'm going to create another thread. So you've got something that starts the thread going, and then that will carry on running <coughs> as well as the main flow of control running at the same time. And then you can create multiple threads like this. So you can do a lot with this, but this also adds complexity. You need to think about perhaps passing information between these threads. So that's something that we'll talk about in more generality another time. But what concerns us now is how threads interact with Swing. So these Swing programs, these Java programs that use this Swing system, will have at least two of these threads. So you've got the kinds of things you've seen already, the initial thread, you run a program, find the main method, and then it runs, runs through that. But then there's also something called an event dispatch thread. So that uh, runs the graphical user interface code and looks after the actions that are, that are triggered by events. And so this adds a complexity, which is called thread safety. So what you can do that's bad is you can have two things running at the same time. And if you're not careful about how you communicate information from one to the other, this thread could be in the middle of doing some computation with some data, and then this other thread changes that data halfway through the, uh, through the computation. So, you know, you're doing, I think of a trivial example, you're doing something to um, create an address label to print out. So you're creating a kind of uh, thing to go to a printer, and you might have another thread that's about being able to, to control the graphical user interface with a system. And you change, you know, the user's updating their address, and they change it halfway through, and then the other threads go at the same time. That prints the first line of their address, their old address, and then the second and third lines of their new address, or something like that. <coughs> so you need to think about this a little bit. You need to think about uh, coordinating things between these threads, and that's a, a great complexity in these kinds of things. I think this is still not a, a very well resolved issue <coughs> in. I don't, I don't think uh, we've got a very good way of dealing with this. There are, there are ways of dealing with it which we'll talk about, but I still don't think we have a, a fantastically good way of dealing with this. So, as an example here, a trivial example, but uh, uh, an one of interest is that you could say here that <coughs> there's a problem with the example we've seen. The event dispatch thread starts when the frame is created, but that label still needs to be created and added. So this, in a sense, is why we've got, you know, this is a 
a deeper reason why we've got this notion of visibility. We, whilst the event dispatch thread's been started, the user can't interact with that graphical user interface until the frame's been made visible. So you pass information out of that main thread until it's been fully created and then you make it visible so that it can respond to the user input. And then there's another way of doing that. So um, again, there are other things to think about. One is this thing about creating components in the main thread and then handing them over when the frame is made visible. And then there's another way of doing it, which is to actually set the components up in the event dispatch thread itself. So have a look at the code for that. So this gets a bit more complex. And this, in a sense, is, is, is too complex in this example. There's no user interaction here. So there's not really a need to do this for this example. But it demonstrates a, a principle, which is that rather than doing all this stuff, this is basically the same code as before, but this is now in a, new, in a method on its own. So you've got a, a static method, which is about creating and showing a graphical user interface. And now, what we do here is somewhat complex. And you can take, you, can, you know, you could take the, you can take this as red, some of this, but you can just take this as a, an atomic unit, this sort of boilerplate code here. But <clears throat> what you're doing here is essentially you're creating a new, you're creating the event dispatch thread explicitly, and then you're creating what's called a run method, which I suppose is the equivalent to the main method in a generic thread. So the run method is what runs the action of the programs within that thread. So what does that do? Well, it runs the, um, the create and show GUI method, which does what we wanted to do it before. But it now runs all this within this event dispatching thread. So nothing to do with creating and showing the user interface is within the main method itself. Just puts it within this, within this, this, this thing that we call the event dispatching thread. So all of that, you think of this as the main thread, and then this event dispatching thread. You do, all you're doing is passing, essentially passing a message, saying start here, and then everything else is happening over there. Now there's nothing else in this this. So, um, let's think about how we add this user interface to a program. So we've talked a bit about this. So we, we've got controls and we want to position them. We'll talk about this in a future lecture. We'll talk about this in another future lecture, how we then link the controls to actions. And then we've mentioned concurrency problems a bit. We've mentioned the idea that we'll probably want the application and the user interface to, to interact, of course we do. So how do we do that? So there, let's test some of the, the challenges. And then these are some of the components that are available for these user interfaces. So you've got labels, which are non-interactive text. You've got buttons, so you click on a button and something happens. Or you select <coughs> one from a group. It's like several things from a group, and then there's things similar to things similar to these, but for text. There are menus and a the notion of a menu bar. There are text areas which contrasted to labels are interactive. So you've got the idea of inputting text. So you've got the idea of just inputting a single piece of text, file name or something. 
or if you just get a large block of text, in which case you need a, a text area that's going to deal with multiple lines and so on. And then there's things that which we, you know, we might not, uh, we might want to have if we've got a more complex interface. You know, if you've got a slider or a scroll bar of some kind, progress bars. There are specific things as well that I haven't mentioned on here for selecting files and things like that. So there's all these sorts of components that we can bring together. So I'll summarise that and we'll then we'll spend 10 minutes on, on one of these quiz uh, things. So we talked about event-driven programming and how that differs from the things that we've done before. We talked about how we use threads to allow <coughs> the main program to carry on and do something whilst also responding to actions. And then we've got a kind of zoo of different components that we can use. So we'll learn about the details of the code and how to code these things. But there's also things like NetBeans and Eclipse have tools that allow you to create the, um, the not the ID code, the GUI code, I mean that, um, interactively via a, uh, via a, a, a little thing where you can drag and drop things. And then you can... You can put things back in, you know, then it gives you stubs that you can link into the main code. So, I think there's time for this. So, do you want to pass those around? And then... Um, so, so this is... This is something that... It used to be on a site called javacommerce.com, which has gone offline, but I managed to find them on someone else's site the other day. And these are quite nice little uh, things to try and get some understanding, try and consolidate your understanding of some of the ideas from the earlier lectures. So, how I suggest we do this, we've got about 10 minutes. So I'll give you five minutes perhaps work in little groups or on your own if you prefer. Go through and make a choice. There's one best answer for each one. Some of the questions are easier than others. And then we'll spend five minutes going through this at the end. Has someone got the attendance sheet? Has that gone round? Sort of going around at the back, someone. Yeah. Attendance sheet, yeah. <coughs> Has anyone not ticked the attendance sheet is here? Well, if you weren't here. Do, do uh, feel free to talk about this with your neighbours.
Right, so I thought we'd go through these, we've only got about five minutes. I don't know whether people have got to the end of this, but we'll, we'll go through these very quickly. So I've crossed out questions one and three, which are a bit strange. So um, question two, what do we feel? Well, that's our answer. B, so software objects have identity, state, and behavior. So they've got some notion of identity, typically through having a, a variable label associated with them. They've got some notion of state, so you've got attributes which can take values, and then they've got behavior um, through the methods that can be executed. So number, number four, what's the, what's the answer there? A. A, yeah, the main method. So if we start Java, Java some class, uh, then the, what, what starts there is the main method. Um, I quite like question five. That's quite a nice question. What do we feel about that? D. D, D or C. People are saying C and people are saying D. D. Are we coming to a consensus on D? So it's a description of a kind of object. Yeah, I'd go for D. Um, I think, yeah, so that's, that's fair enough. So I, I think they're, they're fairly unambiguous. There's some subtleties on some of the others. What about six? This is quite a subtle one, this. Well, a? C? I think there's a distinction here, which is important. And... and I, would, I think there's a distinction between instantiation, which is creating an object, which is A, which is the, the answer, but C is interesting as well, because C, the, the term initialization is used for initially putting things into an object. And I think in Java, those two things are usually conflated together. Yeah? You call a constructor, and that both instantiates an object, it creates an instance of it, but it also initializes it into it will put some some information into the into the attributes typically. So we've got an answer A, but as I say in, in, in Java, you know, we'll typically be doing instantiation and initialization at the same time. What about seven, the static variables and, and methods? What are they? D? Are you all happy about that? So they're things that belong to the class, but don't belong to the objects apart from the reference to the class. So they're things that are shared between all objects, and that's a new way of thinking about it. Um, what about this thing about method invocation? You should know this. Which one's that, number eight? A, straightforward. Nine, what's that? It's a little subtle. The answer there. B, yeah. The gotcha there, I think, is D. You know, that's sort of right. That's wrong, but for a subtle reason, which is you typically create a variable name for an object, but you don't have to. You can pass objects. You can create objects anonymously. You know, you can create a chain of of things. So you have a variable that is created with an object, but that might have another object inside it, which you don't have to give an explicit variable name. So there's quite an interesting <coughs> gotcha there with that. But the, the answer there is B. And finally, what about number 10? D again, yeah? Oh, not again. D, D yeah? So, so there's a specific form of starting strings, yeah, of initializing strings. So you say string alpha equals hello quiz in, in quotation marks. I mean, C is interesting in that uh, it's not too dissimilar to how you create certain kinds of other objects, but D is the right answer. But strings are odd in Java. You know, most things you can divide into primitive types and classes, whereas strings have some behavior that's built into the language like that, but in a lot of other ways they 
uh, are like normal classes. So that's tuning out some of that. So we'll end there and we'll carry on tomorrow talking a bit more about this uh, user interface stuff. Okay, thank you.